All right. Should I should I start? Yes, go on. Okay, great. Uh, first of all, um, I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Martin Lefranc. I work for Brussels Mobility. And Brussels Mobility is a regional agency uh, and authority for transport in the Brussels capital region. Uh, I work here as Smart Mobility Coordinator. I've been working for Brussels Mobility for close to 12 years now, but in this position only a little bit more than one year. And I quickly got involved uh, with uh, shared uh, mobility policies and uh, mobility as a service uh, strategy and, and vision for uh, Brussels capital region. We are currently uh, working on a new sustainable urban mobility plan called Good Move. And all of our actions are taking place in this kind of general framework. Uh, today, I'm going to talk to you about our uh, regulations about shared free floating micro mobility. And I'll also present the results of a, an e scooter user survey that we did uh, during the summer. First of all, uh, the regulations, uh, a little bit of uh, the history. Uh, a little more than two years ago, we had the first generation of uh, shared micro mobility, which were the, the shared uh, bikes uh, from China, uh, which appeared from one day to the next by the hundreds and disappeared almost as quickly. Uh, but due, due to a bankruptcy. So at the time, uh, our previous Minister of Mobility, Minister Pascal Smet, decided, okay, we should uh, prepare some regulations for these kind of services, because he, he had foreseen that more kind of these services would appear. Uh, but he decided to be quite open uh, with uh, the, thing, the thought that private investments in alternatives to cars are more than welcome in the Brussels capital region. So the, the reg regulatory framework would uh, support operators and, and give uh, some legal secure security and safety to the operators, uh, define the rules for a level playing field, and also have some uniformity at the regional level as Brussels is at the same time a city and region and on the same territory of the region, we have 19 municipalities with their own competence of mobility. So it's it's uh, important for us to have some uniformity for the basically the end user who doesn't see the border between one municipality and another. And another. Uh, also uh, have some efficiency um, some efficiency goals for the the services and the, and the, um, and the operators. So we have a regional framework that also has a goal of some common goods in terms of mobility, public space management, environment and public health, as well as road safety. And for example, one of the main uh, um, policy of the regulations is that, uh, of course, combustion engines are forbidden for these kind of vehicles. So the, the vehicles that are uh, concerned by these regulations are, for the moment, scooters, uh, e-bikes and regular bikes, and uh, mopeds. In the range of possible regulations that we, we have at our disposal, there's on one side of the spectrum a complete ban, and on the other side of the spectrum, absolutely nothing. In between, there are two possibilities that we've considered. A concession uh, tender with, with, uh, with that would uh, designate only one operator for this a certain type of uh, service and the license-based model, which, have, which we have chosen because it's more open and, and a balanced model and, and has less uh, pressure and responsibility on the shoulders of the authority. So our regulation has the value of a, a law, a local law at the regional level, because we have an ordinance and a decree. Uh, so that, I think, sets us apart with some other cities where the regulations are uh, that does not uh, is not, are not equal to a law. So this is really quite specific. It's in effect since February 1st of this year, with a transition period until last uh, uh, September 1st. Uh, in the in the time between, uh, we have left some some time for the operators that were active before February 1st uh, to get their license. And since September 1st, every operator here active in Brussels have their license and uh, and uh, all compliance to the regulations. Uh, the requests are made to us at Brussels Mobility and there's a mandatory approach plan uh, 
uh, that the operators have to provide, which determines it's a, a list of uh, information that we are asking for. There's no obligation of goals. So they have to give us the information on the type of vehicle, the, the amount, of course, the operating zone, uh, the methods uh, with which they deploy and collect their, their vehicle, it's information about pricing, of course, the estimated vehicle life expectancy, the maintenance methods and recycling methods, uh, some details about how they, they will share their data and uh, what is that strategy to be comp compliant with the GDPR regulations. So this is for us just information. Uh, I really stress on that because uh, there's no obligation of results. We consider ourselves as on uh, the learning curve. We would like to get more information about how this kind of um, industry is operating. There are, of course, some conditions for obtain obtaining the license. There are some vehicle technical requirements. Uh, as a reminder, no combustion engine plus uh, a reference to the traffic regulations for the, the each type of vehicle. There are some uh, obligations for data sharing uh, and different level of uh, data sharing. In real time, it's the number of available vehicles. And for the moment, uh, trip data and mobility data uh, are given to us on a basis of a quarterly report. Uh, it's a PDF for format. Uh, but we are currently working also on uh, MDS and GBFS um, dashboards. Uh, we are exploring these kind of solutions as well. And eventually, all operators have to work uh, and contribute to an open data platform or a mass platform, because we also have a vision for mobility as a service, of course, here in Brussels. They have to be insured. Uh, no advertising is allowed on the vehicles, except, of course, for sponsors. They have to have a green electricity contract for uh, charging their vehicles. Uh, during the process, they have to, to show a copy of the contract for um, electric power, uh, um, and, and they have to prove that it's uh, green electricity. Uh, they have to be GDPR compliant, and they have an obligation to participate in the satisfaction survey that we, that we will do on a, daily, on a yearly basis uh, uh, among users. There are some operational conditions. They have to operate in minimum three languages. The two official languages of the Brussels Capital Region, which are French, French and Dutch, and English as well, as we are an international and very uh, uh, cosmopolitan uh, city. Uh, there are some, we have defined in regulations on no parking zones and concentration zones. Uh, but for the moment, there are no official no parking zones or concentration zones. We are working on a few uh, based on the agreement that we had with the operators. Uh, we are testing a few no parking zones and we act if we uh, witness any problems and issues in the public space, we will maybe add more or enforce uh, some other regulations on that, on that type. Uh, vehicles uh, or they have a maximum five day unavailability, afterwards they have to be taken away or moved. And if there is a complaint for a parking on the, the public space, uh, there's a 24 hour maximum delay for intervention uh, of the operators, which is actually, we, would, we are realizing now that it's too much. Uh, operators are much quicker than that to, to come and, and move their vehicles. Uh, we, we are currently being reorgan reorganized as Brussels Mobility and uh, a few of the competences that we had before in our department have been given to another department which are uh, busy with control of many different regulations and topics. We have now 14 agents that will also be able to control uh, operations of micromobility operators on public space only, and of course not private, which for example, railway stations and subway stations, uh, the public transport operators will have to uh, manage their own uh, complaints and problem issues with, uh, with operators. And we have an application where we can report as a citizen, we can report some uh, issues in the public space. We will add this um, function, function in the Fix My Street app. So, a quick word about the current li landscape in Brussels. Uh, 10 licenses have been delivered to these operators, and we have approximately 4,000 scooters, 1,800 bikes, and 950 mopeds. Uh, but we have witnessed that two 
of the operators that have come during the summer have already left. Uh, they quickly left uh, only two or three weeks uh, after they, they arrived. And the uh, operat operating zones are um, varying quite quickly. So that's something we, we have in mind in our future uh, mobility as a service regulations is how to, uh, how to manage that operators are actually kind of stable. We have to, re we have to be able to rely on the stability on, of operators in order to be uh, in including them in the mass solutions, as well as the um, Operation, operational zone. We would like in the future eventually that the whole territory of the Brussels capital region are covered by these operators, which is not usually the case. So we are we are currently working on these mass regulations to to be able to go in that direction. Now uh, I will talk to you about our scooter e-scooter user survey that we did during the, the summer. Uh, the illustrations are still in French. I'm sorry about that. I couldn't, uh, as they are images and extracts from a PDF file, I couldn't uh, actually translate it. Um, but first of all, we had uh, 1,200 users uh, of e-scooters that were surveyed, and about 300 of them are users of private scooters. The rest uh, are users of shared scooters. So we have quite a wide uh, range of uh, type of users and we have noticed that there's quite a difference between the two types of users uh, private or shared and we decided to show uh, and, and show the results in for the two types of user in, in order to show the difference it's quite uh, interesting uh, first of all a word about the gender uh, it's a majority of men for the moment 66 percent and 34 percent of uh, women uh, and usually quite young, with, quite young, with a majority between 25 and 34. And they usually uh, employees uh, or with a quite a high level of education, which we consider quite normal as we, we observe this kind of uh, similar profile of users for other uh, services such as a shared car, a Velo, at the, um, sorry, Cambio at the time, and the first uh, form of shared bikes, uh, Velo. Uh, these usually are the profile of um, uh, early adopters. We have we have noticed that, and we have done some research about that. Um, usually, there are uh, new users uh, for a majority of uh, shared uh, scooter. Um, uh, people have used less than ten times uh, e-scooters. Um, so we have uh, very few uh, people who have used it more than 50 times. So everybody's learning, users included. Um, we've noticed also that users of personal private scooters are the more inclined, of course, to use it on a regular basis, with a majority of regular use for uh, private owned scooters and uh, of course much less of this kind of usage uh, for shared scooter users. We've noticed as well that uh, a majority of users are using during peak hours in the morning and at night and for shared users, shared scooter users is a majority of users during the weekends and, and leisure uh, hours. We have noticed that uh, apparently e-scooters are really an enabler for uh, multi-modality. Uh, so a small majority, um, around 50, 54% of users are using their scooter alone, but for the rest of the users, they're using in combination with another mode of transportation. So that's what that's really interesting for us. Um, uh, majority of uh, com combination is with public transport, of course. Uh, so we see it as a really interesting potential as a vehicle for the for the future. The reasons of um, the trips in scooters with, with on scooters is a majority for, of course, um, work, uh, home to work. Uh, trips. Uh, so during peak hours, uh, it's interesting for us to have some people that are actually uh, 
uh, on scooters because uh, we we witnessed some uh, saturation of public transport during peak hours. So that's also an interesting solution for for us um, and for the, the users. We have also asked a question to users about why they actually continue using uh, an e-scooter. And uh, a majority of people are saying that it's actually they are gaining time for their trip. So the first the first reason why they're trying uh, scooters is out of curiosity and for the fun factor. But the question of why are you keep you do you keep using it is because they realize they, they um, gain quite a lot of time on their trip. And the fun factor is still uh, well uh, well in on top of on one of the three main reasons with 34% of the the uh, people who have applied. We have of course asked the question of which kind of other mode of transport do you replace with the scooter? And we have allowed a multiple choice answer with three maximum answers. That's, so that's why here the percentages don't uh, add up to 100%. Uh, of course, um, and as we've seen in other surveys about e-scooters, so public transport combined with walking is the, the main mode of transportation that is replaced by e-scooters. And uh, walking is second, but we see in a very good third position that uh, motorized personal vehicles are replaced uh, with the scooter by 34% for users of their own scooter and only 25% for users of shared e-scooters. But it's um, really, that, that's quite a surprising result for us. We didn't expect it to be this high and it's quite reassuring uh, when, we, uh, when we know that uh, in most cities they had, there is a debate of whether we should have e-scooters or not in the street. We, we now consider with the survey that we have that it's not a relevant question anymore. Uh, we were thinking that way before, but now we have the, this, the results of the survey to, um, to prove it. Uh, there are some hindrances and uh, some uh, negative uh, consequences of having scooters on, on, the, on the ground in the field, but uh, we should work on these negative uh, consequences in order to make the mode of transportation more relevant, even more relevant. Uh, we have also had to ask a few questions about um, uh, road safety and uh, whether users usually wear a helmet. And we've noticed that a, a majority of users never wear their helmet. And a, a very low minority of 16% uh, of users always do. And we've noticed, of course, a very uh, big difference between users of their own scooters and users of shared scooters. Users of their own scooters uh, are uh, almost um, uh, 47 of the, the, these people are using, uh, are always using and wearing their helmet, whereas 71% of users of shared scooters never do. So quite a big difference there. We have uh, to, to ask a few questions about accidentology. Uh, have you ever had an accident on a scooter? And we have about 15% or 13, sorry, 13% of people who they, they did. Uh, and considering that a uh, majority of people had less than 10 trips on scooter, uh, so this question is actually on a quite a low number of trips, but it seems to be quite a, a lot of accidents happening uh, on e-scooters. But fortunately, um, out of these 13%, only half are actually have um, consequences, either physical uh, um, or health related or uh, on the equipment uh, and 6% do have an accident with uh, physical consequences. Um, sorry. Yeah, uh, sorry, only 2.5% of um, users are saying that they had an accident that requ requires a visit to uh, the hospital or the doctor. Uh, uh, usually, um, accidents happen uh, for uh, for users, uh, e-scooter users, on their own, and uh, the not, does not imply uh, another user. Uh, some sixteen percent of the people have said that they had an accident with a car, but the majority happened on themselves. We are all still collecting data from the hospitals here in Brussels, but it's kind of hard to collect these data because 
uh, e-scooters are not um, a box that actually hospitals can check at the ER. Uh, so it's really hard to get relevant data from hospitals. But there seems we've seen some press, some, some articles in press saying that uh, there's definitely a huge increase of people visiting ER due to e-scooter e accidents. Um, but we don't have uh, scientific data to, to uh, actually uh, show. Uh, and apparently a lot of accidents also uh, due to alcohol and uh, driving under the influence or riding under the, the influence. Okay, so that's, this would be it for my presentation. Um, I don't know exactly how this works. I guess there's a, there might be uh, some time for questions. Exactly. Thank you very much, Martin. Uh, let me clarify at the beginning, uh, there was some technical issue and the sound was not getting through. So let me repeat with my short introduction. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. This is the European Road Safety Charter webinar on e-scooter. I'm Dagmara and I will be the moderator today. We already heard the presentation from Mr. Lefranc from Brussels Mobility. And this presentation will be followed by Mr. Lerel, will, uh, that will tell us about the accident and injuries uh, with e-scooters. And okay. let's see if she can hear me. Hold on. Can you hear me? Yes, Catherine. I will come back to you in one second. Um, and after that, Frederica and Christian from Voice Sweden uh, will tell us about the road safety program and the regulation uh, in e-scooters. Uh, the, the broadcast of the, of the webinar will be recorded uh, and available together with the presentation. And if you have some questions during the presentation, they're going to be answered uh, after all. And Martin, I have a question from you from Sam, who is curious about what is the policy of um, bringing the trottinet on board of the public transport vehicle in Brussels? Well, it's a very good question because actually we're actually speaking with the public transport operator, which is called STIB or MIVB here in Brussels, uh, because they're actually asking themselves a question as well. Um, again, there's a difference to be made between the shared uh, scooters, uh, free-floating shared scooters, or the private uh, scooters of, uh, of uh, public transport users. They are asking and they're going to designate an expert in order to uh, evaluate uh, the risk, for example, of a battery uh, catching fire or something like that for their private use. But that is not forbidden for the moment. And it's not, uh, we don't foresee any um, uh, um, sorry, interdiction in, in this kind of regard. But the fact that there are some shared scooters in the uh, public transport infrastructures, such as subway stations or train stations, is definitely an issue and we are working together with them in order to to know what to do and how to operate so for the moment uh, three the main three railway stations are on no parking zones that are working uh, together with the uh, with the operators but we have an issue of course with uh, uh, way stations which are underground so if we make it no parking zones we, as we work in three dimension uh, and on the ground floor, uh, we don't want to forbid uh, parking above uh, metro station. So we, we are working and thinking of different uh, issues. And we also uh, have created a platform which is called the uh, uh, Shared Mobility Task Force, which happened for the first time last week, where we gathered the 19 municipalities, all, all active operators in the uh, uh, my shared micro mobility and uh, public transport operators together with us in order to discuss dif different kind of issues. So we're going to organize these kind of meetings on a regular basis and we will try to, as soon as we think of a solution, we will suggest and propose it to uh, operators in the private sector in order to evaluate the feasibility of it and, and maybe they have a good uh, experience in other cities as well. Thank you very much, Martin. We're going to move now to the next speaker. Um, 
Katrin is a personal injury attorney in Los Angeles. She represents injured scooter riders as well as the pedestrians who were injured by electric scooters. Katrin has been involved with drafting California legislation that applies to scooter companies. She has also consulted many cities providing advices about scooter rules which should be enacted. Katrin will explain us today the accident and injuries uh, involving e-scooters. Uh, Katrin, you are a presenter now. Uh, I can see your presentation. The floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much. So today I'll be talking about how electric scooter accidents are happening, why they're happening, the problem with riders not knowing the rules of the road, why the design of scooters makes them so dangerous, and then I'm going to end with the common injuries that I'm seeing at our law firm. A little bit about the backstory. I live in Santa Monica, California. Santa Monica is the first city in the United States in which electric scooters were dropped. Some say they were dumped, and that was back in September 2017. My first thought when I saw them is, wow, these things look super dangerous. And sure enough, my firm started receiving phone calls from injured scooter riders and injured pedestrians. And over the last two years, I've spoken to well over 400 scooter injury victims. So I feel like I have a unique understanding of how and why scooter accidents are happening. I'm going to show you a short video, it could be a little uncomfortable to watch, um, a short video, a montage of some scooter accidents. This is taken from a bus dash cam. It's a very common accident there that I see. A lot of people, when they crash, land on their shoulders or their forearms, breaking those bones. Very common to go head first over the handlebars. Again, this woman, boom, head first. Okay, so why are these scooter accidents happening? Well, first of all, the vast majority, and I think Felix mentioned that most of the accidents don't involve cars, and that's exactly uh, my experience. Most of the accidents, very few of the calls I get involve the scooter rider being hitting, being hit by a vehicle. The vast majority involve a rider who was injured when the scooter malfunctions. So I'm going to talk to you about the different malfunctions that we see. First of all, the brakes fail. There's two types of brakes on these scooters. Some of the scooters have a cable brake. That's the photo on the left. It's a lever you squeeze. The photo on the right, some of them have an electric brake. You push it down with your thumb. Notice the scooter with the electric brake also has a sticker, don't ride down steep hills. We have found oftentimes when a rider is going down a steep hill on a scooter with an electric brake, that brake does not work at all. Now every scooter that has that electric brake, that thumb paddle brake, has a secondary brake, a rear foot brake. Notice the sticker there, to stop, step on back fender, to give the rider uh, a notice that there's the secondary brake. And there's the sticker, foot brake. Here's the problem. The vast majority of people that I've spoken to who were injured on a scooter with this type of, with an electric brake, they didn't know that there was the secondary brake. Because oftentimes that sticker that says foot brake is only partially there, you can't read it, or it's ripped off entirely. So they don't even know that there's that secondary brake. Another problem, the throttle sticks. A rider sent this to me from the seat. Notice you push down the throttle with your right thumb. It's supposed to pop up when you remove your thumb. Here it didn't pop up. And the problem is that rubber grip to the right of the throttle, it can be loose and it slides to the left and it wedges inside that throttle causing the throttle to stick in the downward position. Uh, I know scooter companies know this is happening. I've seen it referred to on uh, the internet as the poor man's cruise control. Other things that happen with these scooters, the handlebars can detach, the baseboard, uh, the handlebar post detaches from the baseboard, the baseboard breaks in half, the front wheel breaks off, other issues, the handlebars can be loose. If you go over a roadway irregularity, you can lose control if you have loose handlebars. Uh, if you go over a roadway irregularity, the front wheel can just pivot 90 degrees and flip the rider off. 
and then other times the scooter can just shut down unexpectedly mid-ride. We also have a problem with vandals cutting the brake lines. This photo I took here in Santa Monica. You can see three bird scooters, all of them with their brake lines cut. You know, scooter companies know this is happening. Uh, many of the models have internal unexposed brake lines. So they have the ability uh, to keep those brake lines within the, uh, the scooter itself not exposed so no one could cut them. I don't know why all of the models um, aren't, aren't manufactured or designed that way that the brake line is not exposed. Uh, just earlier this month, a man in Florida was arrested for cutting 140 scooter brake lines. They cut him on video. There's another issue, malicious hacking. Researchers discover that a hacker can target a passing scooter up to 300 feet away and force that scooter to suddenly accelerate or brake or lock up. I know scooter companies are working to encrypt against this malicious hacking. Geo speed limiting. So let me explain what this is. It's like virtual fencing. Scooter companies use GPS technology and they can remotely slow or stop a scooter when it enters the perimeter of a certain location. Many cities are requiring geo speed limiting or geo fencing in pedestrian heavy zones. It's intended as a safety feature, but I have found that it can actually be very dangerous. Dangerous because the rider has no warning. Suddenly the scooter stops or slows or speeds up when they're entering or exiting a geofenced area. And because it's unexpected, the rider can lose control and be thrown off the scooter. The geofence zones are on the map, on the scooter app, but of course the rider isn't looking or shouldn't be looking at their cell phone when they're riding. Their cell phone is likely in their back pocket or in their backpack. And then another problem I believe that's happening with geofencing is that it's not 100% accurate. It can apply to a scooter even if the rider has not entered that geofence zone but is merely near that zone. So we have state and local rules that apply to scooter riders, but the problem is that riders often don't know the rules or they don't care about the rules. So we have this rider, of course, she's got a drink in her hand, she's wearing earphones, she's not wearing a helmet, very few, as we all know, very few riders wear helmets. Uh, this guy's riding on the Santa Monica Beach bike path right past the sign saying, don't ride here. And then we've got family out for their Sunday morning electric scooter ride. We've got <clears throat> tandem rider, we got dad and daughter, it's all wrong. So I, I believe that scooter companies and cities, both of them are doing a poor job of educating riders about the rules. When you download the scooter app onto your phone, you agree to follow the rules, but, but what are they? There's a few rules posted on, with stickers on the scooter. The main one, of course, is no riding on sidewalk. And then there are some rules in the app when you first don't download it. But other than that, there's no real education about the rules. And so writers just don't know what they are. And then another problem is that cities are doing a very poor job of enforcing those rules. They rarely, I, my experience is they rarely ticket writers who break the rules. And if, without enforcement, writers have no incentive to follow those rules. When the cities do ticket, uh, the most common citation that they are issuing is for sidewalk riding. And then the second most common is for tandem riding. This is, it's of course illegal to ride an electric scooter on the freeway. This is a dash cam video taken uh, in Dallas, Texas uh, just a few months ago. Okay, that's crazy. I don't know how that guy was not hit. Okay, next I want to move into what makes electric scooters so dangerous. Well, the first thing is their maneuverability. They have short handlebars, and those handlebars are very sensitive to movement. So even a small handlebar movement can result in a significant angle of rotation for that scooter. Next, there's the center of gravity, the rider center of gravity. It's higher, the rider, uh, electric scooter rider center of gravity is higher than a bicyclist center of gravity. 
And then also the electric scooter rider center of gravity is almost on the same axis of rotation or the pivot point as the handlebars and the front wheel. Whereas the bicyclist center of gravity is further back from that pivot point, from the center of that front wheel. And so as a result, a scooter rider's, uh, if they hit an obstacle, the scooter rider is much more likely to flip over the handlebars than a bicyclist. And next, uh, there are, uh, the big problem is the scooter wheels. So let's talk about the wheels and why they're so dangerous. Well, first of all, their size. Uh, they're either eight, sometimes 10 inches. So they're much smaller. The wheels are much smaller, about the third the size of bicycle wheels. And those small wheels have difficulty navigating over pavement irregularities. Then there's the composition of the wheels. They're oftentimes solid rubber as opposed to air filled tires like bicycles have. And the problem with when you don't have air, there's no give in that tire. Another problem is they have very poor traction. These, what I found is that these scooter wheels can even slip on wet roadway paint or wet leaves. Why do sc scooter companies go with these solid rubber tires as opposed to air filled tires? Well, I think that because it's cheaper for them, there's no maintenance. They don't have to worry about flats. They don't have to worry about tire pressure. Okay, next I'm going to show you a picture. This is from the, these scooters originally were made in China. Some of these companies are now making them in-house according to their own design specs. But when they first came out, the manufacturers in China, the user manuals, this is, specific, this is right from the user manual. It says, do not ride on public roads. So they were never intended to be ridden on our roadways. They were also never intended for commercial fleet usage, for, for shared usage. They were intended for recreational use only by the scooter's individual owner. Now, you know, we're a couple years out, scooter companies are on their second and third generation models. And with each successive model, the scooters have become sturdier, more rugged, heavier. Uh, but, you know, the problem still exists that these are our roadways are not designed to accommodate scooters with their small wheels. So these small wheels, they have difficulty navigating over roadway irregularities. I'm going to show you a series of pictures that are um, from the scene of accidents from some of my clients. So these small wheels, of course, have trouble going over potholes. Uh, the picture on the right here, this was one of my clients in San Diego. Minor uh, asphalt patch, minor roadway irregularity caused my client to lose control and uh, catapult over the scooter's handlebars. Another one, it, it doesn't even look like this is a problem, but it was a problem. That slight dip or indentation there caused my, my uh, client to crash. Another one, um, roadway irregularity, some cracks in the road. This is where one of my clients crashed. Okay, this is the number one most common call that I get. A rider is riding on the street. They want to transition from the street to the sidewalk to end their ride and park the scooter. And they, the front wheel makes contact with that little half inch curb where the driveway meets the street. And the scooter comes to a stop, a sudden stop, and the rider is catapulted over the handlebars. What riders tell me is that they expect that a scooter is going to behave like a bicycle, but scooters don't behave like bicycles. There's another, this is one of my clients, and um, you know, that's a little, what is that? Maybe an inch, inch and a half, and that caused him to crash. Another one, I tell people when they go to the, go back to the scene, take a ruler with you. I want it, you to take a picture and show me how high that is. That's about a half inch. Here's another one, that, that's a half inch. Other roadway irregularities that riders may have a problem with, uh, cable car tracks or railroad tracks. This is this cable car tracks here in San Francisco. My client crashed. Another problem is ramps. This is a new one in Los Angeles. They've just started to put down these ramps in downtown Los Angeles. They're putting them, I can't figure it out. I think they're putting them in bike lanes. A bus pulls up to the left of that, uh, to the, of that on the other side of that ramp and passengers and can exit or board the bus and just walk over that ramp. But here's the problem. 
one of my recent cases, I just took the, the scooter riders in the bike lane, they ride onto that ramp, they're coming down the other, the end of the ramp and the scooter bottoms out and the rider is flipped off the scooter. So that's another danger rider may, a rider may encounter. Going back to that uh, manufacturer's user manual, it also says, do not take your hands off the handlebars. Do not ride with one hand only. Well, these scooters were designed to require that both hands are always on the handlebar, right? But scooters don't have turn signals. Here in California, scooter riders are required to use turn signals. So they must take a hand off the handlebar to give a turn signal. These scooters are already so unstable. If you take a hand off, you could easily lose control. I'm gonna show you another uh, montage of some accidents. What can happen if you take your hand off the handlebars? Notice they often go down right on their arm. So we see a lot of broken forearms broken shoulders, torn tears in the shoulder. Um, what's the solution? Well, the solution would be these scooter companies should either add turn signals to these scooters or come up with an alternative design that allows for one-handed operation. This is, a, this is actually an electric skateboard that Audi is coming out with next year, and it's designed to allow for, or designed to operate with just one hand, which would allow riders to give hand turn signals. Okay, so there's something that I've observed because so many of the people who call me who are injured, turns out are tourists. They are tourists who are injured in San Diego or Santa Monica, they're on vacation or they're at a business conference. They come from a city that doesn't have scooters. They come out their hotel and these scooter companies are smart. They just stack their scooters right up in front of that hotel and the tourist sees these scooters, wow, that looks so easy, it looks so fun, and there's no safety gear required, and wow, it must be safe, the city allows them to be available to the public everywhere, so they hop on a scooter. The problem is, these tourist riders, they don't know the rules that apply to scooter riders, and they don't know how to operate scooters. There was a recent study that found that of the uh, electric scooter riders brought into emergency rooms, for over one third of them, it was their first time on a scooter when they were injured. Next, I wanna talk about the injuries that, are, that I see happening with my clients. So first of all, there's injuries to the brain, the head and the face, a lot of broken jaws, a lot of cracked teeth, and of course, head injuries because it's a big problem. Very, very few people wear uh, helmets. And then regarding to the, the teeth, oh my gosh, I, I'm learning how expensive it is that dental work can be. And very, very few people have dental insurance. And then there's, we saw from the videos, when you go down, you often go down on your forearm. So there's a lot of broken wrists and the broken bones, the radius and the ulna in the uh, forearm. And then there are broken legs, the lower extremities. The single uh, most common injury that I see are two broken bones in the lower leg. It's the tibia and the fibula. It's a very bad injury. It requires surgery with plates and screws. It's so common, I gave it a name. I call it the e-scooter tib fib special. And here's how it happens. The rider's going along, maybe the brakes fail or the throttle sticks. So the rider puts his or her leg down to try and stop, snap, snap the tibia and the fibula break. Very bad injury. There have been two studies published this year uh, looking at scooter rider injuries. One was done by the JAMA, the Journal of American Medical Association. The other done by CDC, the Centers for Disease Control. That study was done in Austin, Texas. What they found is that during the time these studies were conducted, more uh, e-scooter riders were brought into emergency room for injuries than bicycle riders. Uh, and then as to the e-scooter riders who were brought in, 40 to 44% had head injuries, 30% had fractures. And by the way, those fractures, you know, I've been 
practicing law for over 25 years. I've represented a lot of bicycle accident victims. What I see with bicycle accident victims, I see broken bones. With scooters, I see shattered bones. Shattered bones requiring surgery, requiring plates and screws. So the injuries are much more severe than I see with bicycle accidents. Uh, and then helmets, only 4% of riders wear helmets. And then almost 11% were minors. That's a big problem. Uh, scooter companies need to figure out a better way to make it difficult for uh, minors to access these scooters. So that's the end of my presentation. Thank you so much. And feel free to reach out to me. And you can follow us on Instagram where I try and highlight some of the uh, dangers that I'm seeing with electric scooters. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katrin, for your interesting presentation. I have a question to you from Anna, who is uh, who would like to know what is the most common advice that you give for the cities uh, when they're about to implement the sharing scheme for e-scooters? The number one thing that I recommend to cities require helmets. It's the absolute number one thing that uh, cities can do. Some cities are telling me uh, maybe they their state doesn't allow. I don't know. I mean, that's if if you can do it, the number one thing would be helmets. Absolutely. Thank you very much, Katrin. I cannot see any other question. Your presentation is also going to be available for all participants after the webinar. We will move uh, forward toward the last presentation of today. And we're going to hear uh, Christian, who is a VP Public Policy at VOI Technology and leads VOI dialogue with cities and government across Europe. He joined VOI at the same day when they launched its home city, Stockholm. And from that date, he is there to ensure close dialogue with the city and smooth local adaptation before scooters are put on the street. Uh, Christian came from Uber, where he was rep responsible for public policy in the Nordic region. And before that, he was a civil servant in the Danish Ministry of Business. And together with uh, Christian, uh, we're going to hear uh, Frederica, who is a marketing spe uh, specialist at Voy Technology Sweden, working mainly towards the Swedish market. Uh, she started at VOI in May and led the project of the company for the global safety campaign, like uh, right like Voila. Uh, the core of this campaign was to the online traffic test for e-scooter riders, which was developed and certified through collaboration with uh, NTF Sweden and Vias Institute uh, from Belgium. Frederica and Christian are making you now the presenters. You're going to be able to share your screen. The floor is yours. Thank you, Dagmara. Um, hi, guys. I don't know what happened to my screen. Let me get it up again. So, can you see it now? I think you can. Yes, uh, everything is OK. Perfect. Uh, so I'm Frederica. And um, yeah, thank you for the presentation, Dagmara. Uh, we work at uh, Voy Technology, uh, who um, is one of Europe's largest providers of uh, micromobility. And in that sense, uh, as for now, it's uh, the fleet is consisting of e-scooters. Um, and uh, we are also the fastest growing startup in Europe, as for now, uh, in terms of revenue. Uh, like Dagmara said, we started in Stockholm and we started last year in September. So we've been active for a bit over a year. And uh, since then, our user base has uh, grown to about 4 million people who are using the app and uh, has together taken about 10 million rides. Um, we just launched our 11th country, which is Italy, and are now active in a bit over 40 markets and, or cities. Yeah, I'm going to go over this to Christian. Hi, everyone. Uh, nice to meet you all. Um, and uh, thank you for um, allowing us to take part in this um, 
webinar. Um, it's a really good initiative and a good way to learn. Uh, at least I've uh, felt that it was very interesting to to listen to the last two presentations, uh, and definitely there's a lot of learnings there that I will um, that I will take uh, away and and um, and we will uh, use as um, as insights to to develop further. Um, as we are a new industry, it's very important to have this dialogue and make sure that we um, grow and, and, and improve together. Um, that's basically what we built uh, on uh, at VOI. We are basically um, built on dialogue um, with cities and with other stakeholders in cities and in countries that are relevant for making this um, a long-term uh, transportation option for, for people who um, wants to connect to public transport and and wants to um, um, a sustainable tra and, and affordable transport option in the city basically um, but this is not about um, e-scooters in general this is more about the safety aspects and how we see um, safety um, as, as an issue um, in the e-scooter world um, I will go through a few things around uh, the regulatory differences between um, some of the countries we're operating in um, and what we are seeing um, with regards to, to best practice and what we are do then doing to um, make sure that um, the users are educated um, and that cities also play a part in that education and uh, that we are um, basically join forces in, in, in making sure that, that the, this mode of transportation will be as safe as possible going forward. Um, so uh, the way um, some of the things that are um, that we're seeing uh, is that across Europe, uh, as, 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 as we usually say, the reason why we can make um, product regulation and consumer protection regulation for the whole of Europe uh, in, 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 uh, in the European institutions is because uh, when at the end of the day, all uh, people are the same. So uh, the way they have to be protected, uh, the way users have to be protected in Greece is, is the is same way as they have to be protected in uh, Sweden. And, um, and that's why we have uh, common consumer protection um, rules. That's why we have common product rules that are harmonized across the European countries. And I think there are some of uh, some rules that are probably relevant to harmonize in, in, in this uh, field. That's a different discu discussion. What we're seeing now is some of the best practice that is uh, arising is that some countries are already now doing uh, classification of the scooters, which is an important part of also driving safety, because classification also then the the countries also um, take a stand take a stance in relation to um, what are the standards the scooters need to make, meet, and I think there there's definitely a need for some kind of um, standard for for what scooters need to meet uh, to be safe then what we're seeing is uh, regulations are defining where they can be driven um, can sidewalks or pedestrian areas be allowed uh, be allowed uh, what are the speed levels um, for for scooters that's also different in different countries it varies between uh, 50 from 15 kilometers per hour to uh, 25 kilometers per hour uh, in some 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 places, it's actually still 30. Um, there's differences in parking rules. There's differences in age limitations. So um, if you take Sweden, for example, it's 15 years. If you take other countries, it's it's 18. And and um, this is something that we want to align ourselves with 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 the best practice. And of course, it makes it difficult uh, when the regulation in the different countries are not. Um, harmonized to make sure that uh, we give the right recommendations and uh, educate the user in the right way. We have to do this in different ways uh, between different countries. Um, could we move to the next slide? Yes. No. Oh. So basically what we do is that we try to create a baseline for uh, safety in all countries. Um, while still adapting to national rules. So what something that we want to have in all countries is insurance. So basically making sure that the rider is insured when uh, they, they do um, harm to a third party, um, that uh, riders need to be 18 years old. I think it's, uh, uh, and we think at Boy that it's a good baseline 
and that it indicates that this is something that you need to be uh, a, an adult to use and it's not something that you use for fun. Um, then um, we uh, of course try to induce and educate responsible riding and parking and that's what uh, the Ride Like Boiler campaign and uh, traffic test is all about and uh, Frederica will talk more about that in a, in a few minutes. Um, and then we um, really um, try to have as close dialogue with municipalities as possible about lo local circumstances. I would say uh, the, the places where we have the most success in, in um, uh, creating the best perception of e-scooters among the general population and where we'd see uh, least uh, accidents happening uh, are the places where we have a dialogue with the municipality from the beginning where we communicate uh, where, where we communicate with the municipality uh, on all uh, possible channels uh, about the rules and where we have a close dialogue uh, and cooperation with law enforcement um, that so that they also enforce um, the, the different rules that apply. Um, so for example in um, most Nordic countries um, bicycle rules apply to for example drunk driving which means that you can can actually um, drive uh, under the influence of alcohol on an e-scooter. Um, we don't think that's, uh, it should, that should be allowed, of course, uh, and we also recommend not, uh, or we say that people cannot drive under the influence, but if it's not a, a look, if it's not aligned with the regulation, uh, the police cannot enforce it. Um, so what we're seeing, for example, in Denmark, where it, 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 when we, with regards to drunk driving, it's actually um, the same rules as for uh, driving a car. Um, there we see that the, the police is heavily enforcing on people driving drunk and uh, it has an effect, right? So, so there has to be some kind of alignment there. Um, then what we are also uh, focusing a lot on is uh, how, we, how engineering and product can work uh, together with uh, the, our public policy team and the people, uh, the operations team on the front lines uh, to make sure that uh, the product and both the software and the hardware is uh, engineered so that um, it um, nudges people towards, towards a more safe um, behavior on the streets. And that's both, uh, of course, communicating to people in the app um, communicating to people when they um, sign up because we know um, as Catherine said that um, the most accidents happen with uh, first time or second time users so that we really induce people to um, to, to take uh, take like to be aware of the traffic rules and to be aware of what the risks are uh, when when riding from the beginning um, and that's also where we heavily push our traffic school to new users. Um, then with the, the, the hardware, of course, we try to um, improve that all the time. We do that in, in, in R&D efforts with uh, producers. Um, and we consistently, of course, choose the best and most safe vehicles. Um, we, as all other companies in the e-scooter space have tried out different vehicles and we have seen the disadvantages and advantages between different uh, vehicles and I agree that not all vehicles have been as uh, like as safe as they uh, could um, but it's also a, a an industry that's developing quite quickly um, and as you if you look at other industries um, um, for example the car industry or, or others it, it, it is uh, quite impressive how e-scooters have developed already in the first uh, years. So I'm uh, quite um, confident that we will see safer and more safe vehicles. And I am quite confident that when regulation uh, comes into force or standards comes into force in, in Europe around um, e-scooters, uh, all operators that are serious um, will have adapted to those regulations and uh, operators who, who are not serious uh, will, will simply uh, die out. Um, and, uh, but of course, regulations are needed to, to support this. So um, this is 
basically summing up our approach to safety. Um, one is the cities. Um, basically, the way we that's it's the way we think um, the way we think safety is best. Um, safety is best, uh, or the the way we we think that we we uh, make it safe to to ride scooters is through dialogue and clear regulations. Um, so that's the first recommendation to cities. Uh, we say that uh, you, you need to really communicate to your citizens um, on the rules, but also on uh, how to, to ride the vehicles um, and, and, and in, a, in a safe way and how to respect other people in traffic. Um, and then we also uh, try to invest in dialogue around infrastructure because uh, what we see is that the same uh, safety as the safety aspects that are relevant for for bikes um, and coming from Copenhagen I know this um, I bike every day um, and uh, when when I come to, to another city in Europe and I use an e-scooter or a bike um, it feels unsafe compared to Copenhagen and it it, it, it all uh, comes down to, to infrastructure um, where um, the infrastructure for for bikes and for scooters are um, is is mostly the same. Um, it's shared, and therefore it also needs to 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 to, to go in uh, to the considerations around infrastructure development. Um, what 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 is best suited for for scooters, um, and there it plays together with of course the product and how that is developed and rules that are set for that. Um, as we saw for some of the accident. Um, then uh, another thing that is very important uh, in our mind is that we uh, get, uh, it, it, it ties together with clear, clear rules, but that we get licensing in cities. Uh, so we saw uh, Martin uh, is presented from, from, uh, from Brussels um, and Brussels have, uh, has, uh, has adop adopted a um, quite uh, forward-looking regulation uh, that, that puts in place licensing. Um, we think the most important uh, point in, in creating licensing is to create uh, create a, a, a standard for, for operators that they have to comply with um, so that we have an equal playing field but that also um, e-scooter companies uh, adhere to uh, common standards when it comes to uh, safety. Uh, in a city, and hopefully we'll learn more and more about what is actually safe in the future. Thank you, Christian. Uh, I think I went into this already, right? Yeah, basically, uh, I can go through it quickly uh, since it's one of our three approaches. But the the product of Voy or e-scooters basically consists of uh, vehicles and. The, the fleet obviously and the app which are connected so um, these are both parts that we need to work on uh, and develop features um, that improve the safety behavior of our users in the end um, so um, when it comes to the vehicles as we have gone over this is something that the engineering teams work on continuously to to make better better and safer products and make them, making them more robust and um, improving the size of the wheels, which is a very important aspect as Catherine um, highlighted in the previous presentation. And also when it comes to brakes, for example, to make them stronger and, um, and just more powerful so that, um, so that the vehicle becomes safer and more controllable. Uh, and um, then when it comes to the app, uh, of course, hacking and, uh, and processes like that are always trying to be fought um, to improve the, so that someone can go into our software and actually um, affect the, the ride. Um, I haven't heard about that in Boy, but maybe that's something that has happened in Diamond Bird. Um, so, of course, the engineering teams their work on technical improvements to solve those kind of matters. Um, but something else that we have been working on in Boy is the implementation of slow zones, uh, which basically means that in areas with um, a lot of pedestrians or just 
zones where you should be um, more careful and ride slower. We have implemented this as a technical feature, so when the scooter enters this, it slowly slows down to a pace where where you are actually at a pedestrian pace, basically. And uh, the third part that we have focused a lot on is incentivized parking zones, uh, which is a way for us to encourage our users to park correctly, because even if parking is not always um, an obstacle for the people riding, it's certainly a, a issue sometimes for the people around and who the ones who are walking and uh, specifically visually impaired people. So that's something that we have worked on a lot to give boy credits or, or riding credits so that you can ride for free if you actually park in one of these zones. And also, of course, putting out areas with uh, no parking zones where you cannot park the scooter um, and where you're not supposed to ride, in other words. Um, and the third part of this is the users, and uh, this is more of my side from marketing uh, that we are working very hard on since you can you can improve the app and you can improve the vehicles, but in the end um, it's the user who is controlling the vehicle while standing on it, and they need to know what what rules there are and how to ride in a safe manner and how the scooter works um, on it, like have a basic vehicle knowledge before stepping on the scooters. And uh, something that we have focused a lot on in all our cities uh, from start is to have pop-up events. And this is something that other competitors haven't uh, done as much uh, since it's quite time consuming and, and resource consuming. But we have actually been out in the markets in, in a lot of like dense places to meet the users and hold safety events and educate users on how to ride it, especially when the vehicles are new in a city and we try to meet all the new users. Uh, and like you see here on the, on the right side, it's a, a picture from Paris from one of these kind of safety events where the users actually get to try the scooters in a safe and, and uh, like untrafficked area so that you get a feeling of the scooter and how it works, how the brakes works, how to give gas and uh, so forth. Um, a second uh, main part of, of our approach from the marketing side has been to actually give out a lot of helmets, which has been um, quite a big cost for us, but still something that we have chosen to really focus on because we want to encourage people to wear it. Uh, we have done marketing research and found that people don't want to have the helmets hanging on the scooters or attached to the scooters because they won't use it because they don't they don't think it's hygienic basically to share helmets with other users. Um, and because of that, we have instead continuously started to give out helmets and at this point we're in our third round so um, by Christmas we will have given out about 30,000 helmets um, and we uh, just want to encourage users to to wear them. We also use a lot of in-app communication as of uh, both the, the first um, the first messaging you get when you open the app, of course, with the different rules and and what like how to join the Voy Club or how to um, how to ride and what regulations and rules we have. Uh, but then we also keep like talking to people through the app uh, on different occasions to remind them to wear a helmet or. Um, when it's uh, snowy out, for example, to be uh, careful and um, things like that. So that were when it's rain or, or other road conditions that you should be careful of. Um, so that's our way to communicate to our users on a more direct level. Um, then social media communication is, of course, very important as a lot of our uh, users also follow us on social media and here comes in uh, normalizing helmet use um, as of every picture that we post um, if the person is standing on the scooter and riding they should have a helmet on it and even 
if they're not standing on the scooter and it's a scooter in the picture, you should always have a helmet in the picture to just show that this is something that you should always have. And this is something that I have realized that our competitors are not doing. Uh, they're doing it to some extent, but has not taken this 100% approach that we did. Um, and this is something that is super important, I think, to just normalize the use of helmet in, in um, the relation to these vehicles. Um, we also, I think Christian mentioned that partly before, but um, when we work with cities and new launches in new cities, uh, it's very important to stress all this from uh, like safety approach from uh, both sides. So what we have done in, um, for example, Madrid and uh, Odense in Denmark, uh, we um, have done videos where like tutorial videos of how to ride the scooter and what you can do and what you cannot do uh, and so forth in collaboration with the cities that has then been aired from through different channels to the users in the new cities which has proven very successful um, and the last part uh, that i'm going to talk about today which has been our main uh, approach to road safety so far, which is something that we have focused on a lot during the last few months, is our uh, campaign Ride Like Boila, where um, we have the, the main component of this is actually to develop this virtual traffic test uh, for our users and for others as well. Um, so in the next slide, I'm going to show you a pic or a video so you get an idea of this campaign. There was light, then earth, water, amoeba, weird animal, weird animal, cats, humankind, and then finally, boy, the holy trinity of scooter app, and me, Boila, here to guide humankind to a safe ride. Come on, caveman. Boy is really freaking good, but some humans weren't ready for its power. It corrupted them into riding like dumb dummies, but I'm here to change that. Hey, riders! Oh my god! Take this knowledge and be safe. You can cruise around on it, go cross town, but I like more now. Yeah. Don't forget your helmet just because you don't need a permit. Go to ridelikeboyla.com. Be excellent at my traffic school and I will treat you with free rides. Let's go. Yeah, so here you got an idea of what this campaign was about. So this was the promotional video for um, the online traffic test. And uh, this is a test that was divided into five main parts uh, of traffic rules and, and uh, just boy rules basically also. But uh, one part was uh, general rules that apply for everyone and in, that is not changing for any specific country. Then we had um, parking rules, scooter knowledge, um, traffic rules, and then signs and signals. Um, which were, of course, a bit adapted for the different countries. And this, that's where Vias came in and, and helped us out with the different regulations in different uh, markets. So thank you a lot for that. Um, and just to give a brief uh, of this traffic school, um, this, this was launched in early September, so a bit over a month ago. And uh, from or since then, uh, 130,000 users actually completed this test uh, and uh, it's only been a month so we're of course looking forward to see how many more will will do it um, continuously uh, and uh, now that we're starting to get some insights from this we can uh, conclude that there are some main points we don't have that accurate data as of yet and and you shouldn't base too much on this uh, since it's only only 130,000 people who completed it so far. Uh, but uh, some things that we can really see that our users have problems with is uh, the priority when turning left, uh, who you are gonna show priority or who has priority when you uh, are turning in an intersection, uh, which can be both pedestrians and uh, 
like opposite traffic coming from the other direction. Um, and the second thing um, is the react what, what reaction distance means. Uh, and these are both um, about 30% who did not know what this is, um, which is quite a high number. And it also are two things that are quite main when you're taking a driver's license. Um, so it's some indication of that maybe these people haven't gone through a driving's license theory test. Uh, which is something that we do know is decreasing when it comes to uh, especially millennials to take driver's license. So that's um, that's the basic why we developed this traffic school, uh, and we really hope that our that this can encourage our riders to um, to learn more about traffic behavior and uh, how to ride safe and uh, and also go more in detail on different areas of, of road safety, such as parking or knowing the, the vehicle and um, what different signs means and, uh, and so forth to be better integrated in the traffic systems. Um, and a very important part of this that, actually, that we are doing to incentivize the people to actually do it is that we give out free credits for the people who complete the test or for every section that you complete, you get boy credits to ride for in the app. Um, so yeah, that's uh, that's all for me and uh, Christian, unless you have anything to add, Christian. I take that as a no. <laughs> yeah, I just had to unmute, but uh, that is an... That is a, a no. I think um, we've been through all of it. Uh, so, of course, we're happy to receive uh, any questions if we have um, time for that. Yes, thank you very much, Frederick and Christian. That was very interesting. And there have been actually questions regarding both uh, your approach to social media in regards to the safety and about providing the technical uh, practice classes, but I, I, I believe these were answered within your presentation later on. But Robert has a question uh, regarding if you plan any follow-up activities based on the results of the test. For example, more practice classes focus on the problem that came out from the results. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're still, uh, since it's only a month since it was launched, uh, we are still collecting the data from the test. Uh, and we have said that we will give it three months to collect the, the first amount of data. And uh, after that, we can sit and look over it with uh, and have bigger numbers and better ideas from each country, because it can also be that uh, in different countries, the users have difficulties with uh, some areas and uh, in a different country, it's something completely different. And uh, from that, I mean, the reason why we're doing this is because also we want to get insight in what we need to uh, improve as a company when it comes to our communication with users. So that's definitely something that we have in mind, yes. Great, thank you very much, Fredrika, for the for your answer, and uh, thank to all of the speakers, to Martin, Katrin, and Fredrika and Christian for your uh, very interesting presentations today. I'm sure the information provided came very handy for uh, all of the participants. All of this presentation, uh, as well as the broadcast of the webinar, will be available online within a few days uh, on the website of the charter, uh, erscharter.eu. Thank you very much, everyone, for your attention. Have a good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.